be here today. This is another critical step in our strategy to try to get ahead of this thing, to try to be proactive, not just wait until people are sick to seek tests, but to make testing much more widely available. With that, Governor, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I, too, want to extend the thanks. We have Mr. Baxley here from uh, Vault Health. They're a public-private uh, partnership that we've done. Uh, they were just mentioning that Minnesota is pretty unique in how we've approached this and that they believe that the capacity for us to really do the expansive testing necessary to get a handle on this is, is there. I'd also note that in addition to uh, the Minneapolis Convention Center being open at noon for that testing, if you're out there and you're listening and you're just wondering and you've got an opportunity, come by and do this. It won't take long. You'll be here quickly. I think you've got to fast for 30 minutes ahead of time and, um, and get this thing done. Um, you can also know that in the next week or so, those 11 sites will pop up at armories across uh, Minnesota and the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. We also have 23 of our counties in a pilot program on in-home saliva testing as, as well as the Red Lake Nation. The goal is to let everybody do that. And, and Commissioner Malcolm brought up a really great point. Having that laboratory here for processing this is a key. You're seeing all the stories about people who are waiting for uh, test results. If you're waiting more than two days, it basically becomes useless because people aren't waiting at home. They're either going out in that period where they've been tested, but they haven't got results, and then we lose all the control that comes with that. So that's really critical. And at this point in time, they're, they're meeting what they said they could do. So uh, we've, got, uh, we've got work to do, Minnesota. Uh, I'm, I'm imploring, especially 18 to 35-year-olds, you're not feeling sick. You don't think you have COVID. You're sick of this. You've got stuff to do. Um, as the commissioner said, unfortunately, this virus is using that as the transmission method. And where you're gathering, it is going. And then if it's hitting someone else, it's going into long-term care facilities. It's going into schools. It's going to your elderly family members or those with underlying conditions. And I want to just be clear. It's not as if you're 18 to 35 and you have this that you can't get sick. We've unfortunately seen that that's the case. So um, this is our first step. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. I'm, I would like to note that I think it's a incredibly positive development that we have a national COVID strategy coming out that Dr. Mike Osterholm is going to be a part of that. Uh, the names that are on there are people that we've been listening to. And as Dan Huff always says, Nothing will change with Minnesota's approach that we will take a data-driven scientific approach to infectious disease control around COVID-19, and this is just one more step. So with that, any questions? Are you going to have to close down the state again? The question is about closing down the state. I want to be clear that for all of us, um, what we've learned since March about COVID is quite a bit, and we've certainly learned a lot about how it spreads. We've learned about how our behaviors uh, impact that. Using the tools that we have, and especially back in March, we opened up that toolbox and one of the things we did was do a stay at home order. What I would have to say is we've learned a lot about this. That's a pretty blunt instrument to attack COVID-19. It's one that has incredible ramifications. It was the right tool early on because it allowed us to build up PPE testing and hospitals. It's not something that I want to do, but I think it's one of the things we're going to have to be surgically looking at and thinking about this. And I think many of you can extrapolate and start thinking about this. Where are 18 and 35 year olds congregating together? Where are they and what are the incidents of some of this social spread happening? And it makes sense to us now to target those much more surgically, much more aggressively than a statewide stay at home order. Because at this point in time, we've learned that we can do retail. We can do education, some of it in person, if, if we're able to test, contain, and contact trace those folks to get it isolated. So not at this time, but we are prepared to take some steps. Governor, with hospitals filling up, any plan for some type of temporary hospital space? Yeah, well, and we're prepared. And for all of those, again, it was insurance policy, just to be clear, um, building out and making the plans for surge expansion both on hospital space, ICU space, where we would move people who weren't COVID, but might be recovering from something that we could put them in. Those plans are there, and we feel pretty good that, that that space is available. My biggest concern is around the staff that is going to be there to operate them. And at this point in time, we're still using uh, federal public health nurses. We've been given some more that to come in. We're working with our hospital partners to figure out how to do that. 
But I think if you're looking at this, and I think you saw some of the things that, whether it be at Centric Care out in St. Cloud or, or here, this is going to happen. It is going to happen. And the one thing is, and many of you have asked about this, and I will own this, we're better at treating people. But I will tell you, when this first came on about making these plans, the irresponsibleness of saying we don't need to do this, or why are we spending the money on these facilities that we haven't used yet, unfortunately, we may be starting to use them. So yes, they're ready to go. Some expansions are starting to happen. I, I think what we learned was is early on, like you saw in New York, they used the Javis Center or they built outdoor facilities. That isn't our goal. We do have some converted long-term care facilities that are set up and ready to go. So within 72 hours, if we get a massive overflow, we have the capacity to vastly expand, but we're gonna have to protect and keep that workforce safe. Yeah, we had a long conversation with superintendents as we were getting ready to issue uh, an EO to try and move some of the things uh, to make it. Again, I want to be clear about this. I taught for over 20 years and my wife for over 30. Um, no one would design an education system like we're having to operate right now. So I believe there's been great successes and we've done a pretty good job. But let's be very clear. No one wants to do it this way. And so with that conversation with them, was to talk to them about ways we can continue to be flexible. Where are we falling through the, the gaps? And then I think to prepare them for this. I mean, I don't know if it was, I get the idea of, and again, I'm the eternal optimist, but you have to be grounded in reality. There's folks out there telling people that we could just open up everything. Think about that, that we should just let everybody go and that we don't need to do anything, get rid of these damn masks, put every kid back in school or whatever. These superintendents are super nervous about conflicting things they're getting. And what we're telling them is our plan on safe schools, if we're able to test and we get compliance on mass, we can continue to go forward in a pretty functioning way with them. But to let them know we're still working in partnership with them. We're still using that approach to using the local data coupled with their individual circumstances. So they're, they're stressed. Teachers are stressed. Um, Minnesotans are stressed, but here's the thing. Instead of just wringing our hands, let's bring science, data, ingenuity, public-private partnerships to solve this thing. And I just want to be very clear. Conscious decisions were made in states to approach this differently, and some states had better outcomes. But here's the deal. It was only a matter of time before we're in this with all 50 states, and it's bleeding over. So I have been asking for a long time for a concerted, national strategy around this, I think that starts today. The good news is Minnesota's already a few steps ahead of that. Sounds like you are not ready to issue a plan-wide stay-at-home order, but how close are you to that? Yeah, close. I'll be back tomorrow with you. Um, we are close, and I think, again, part of this is letting Minnesotans think about this. This, this nonsense that we've been in, that somehow governors have hurt the economy by making decisions around that. I, I think we know that's nonsense and that fever has kind of broken. Um, I need some partnerships and I'll be talking with legislative leaders today about some help about what we do and how we turn that dial to again, have the maximum health effect, but minimize the economic impact that it has. Because again, whether we do anything or not, it's not as if states that were totally open have had massive economic growth in this. People know that you can't just go into crowded spaces. And I want to be clear about this. Whether you're celebrating an election victory or you're on the field at Notre Dame or you're gathered in your backyard with a number of people, all of those things put us at risk. And again, our infectious disease director, Chris Ayersman, has drilled this into me. Masks and social distancing like we're doing reduces the risk. It does not eliminate the risk. And I think for any of us to get so complacent to believe, well, I'm doing everything right, there's still a risk and we measure that. So gathering in a place with ventilation to put out a public service announcement about testing, there's a calculated risk in that. So I'm gonna go back with them today for us to look at that. But yes, I think you can see we're pretty close. What is the super spreader in the past? Well, Jan, do you wanna, I don't know if it's necessary super spreaders, but mini spreaders that we're seeing might be a better way. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that we clearly know from the data is that, and we've said this many a time, it's not just one or two or three big events, it's thousands of events happening all over the state all the time. 
the gatherings that the governor talked about. And unfortunately, um, perhaps it's just human nature, but we feel safer when we're around our, our family, our close friends. Uh, but gathering in numbers is riskier today than it was a month ago, just flat out the facts because of, of uh, the degree of community spread that's out there. So we do know that you know it, it is a whole bunch of different kinds of social gatherings, especially larger celebratory gatherings, weddings, funerals, uh, graduation parties, you know, and this is tragic. These are huge life milestones, and of course everybody wants to celebrate, but large gatherings right now are dangerous. Yes, we, we do uh, keep track of how many, uh, how many worker cases and how many patron cases we can trace back to specific environments. Um, and we, we do uh, look at that data every, uh, every week. I don't have, probably tomorrow we'll, we can give you an update on the, on the numbers in those situations. But I also want to just remind folks that when we do publish these numbers, that's just the primary case. We don't, we don't count in those numbers how many people that primary case has, uh, has spread the virus to. We can find out some of that through contact tracing, but we also do uh, estimates of you know, how many people on average uh, might be infected by that first primary case. And it's, it's a wide range. Some people, and this is part of the science we're still learning about, some people don't spread it to others very readily at all. Other individuals, for reasons unknown, have the capacity to, to spread it uh, to a lot of people in, in one setting. So this is all kind of you know, calculated on the basis of the numbers that are coming back. Pardon me? The, there, there, there are definitely, um, if you, if you look at all the, all the sources of spread, workplaces, retail, uh, the celebratory events, bars and restaurants, th there is, there are, that is a very large category of, of cases. So we, we definitely are uh, talking about and looking at the data. Are there patterns there? Are there things, as the governor said, that we can do that are more targeted and more specific in nature um, to, to just, in, and that's why we've, you know, for a long time been really in uh, talking about the capacity limits, um, really urging both the business owners and patrons to take those social distancing guidelines very seriously. Uh, but that, that is definitely something we'll be talking more about tomorrow. Peter, I would reaction to the, uh, the Pfizer news. Yeah, I'll come back to that. I'll follow up, Peter, with your question because he asked about me. This is a very important question because I want to just be clear. Um, we certainly want to be incredibly careful. We are not scapegoating the hospitality industry. It's by the nature of this virus that they're setting and by the nature of how you stand at a bar or you deliver, you set at a table, increases that. But what Peter's asking and what we will provide is, what's the data to show this? You're not just throwing a, a dart in the dark to say if we shut down bars, this will get better. We're gonna be able to show the percentage of we think where that can start to slow that down. And I just wanna add, and I'm, have a long history in Congress about this, about the privacy data that come with this. This has always been something that we're dealing with simultaneously. We're looking at, and, and countries and states have implemented, and Minnesota will be part of this, um, and it's voluntary. Say, for example, I took my test, which I did this morning, and I get a notice this afternoon that I'm positive. There will be a capacity that I can hit on that that says notify the people are around. All of your phones will buzz this afternoon and tell you you are within proximity of someone anonymously who had COVID and you should get tested. Now, I have the right, if I get that, to not send it, the privacy right, to not send it. So we're not forcing anybody to do that. And you have the right to ignore it. But if we really want to tackle this, Jan, I think I'm getting this right, this is the capacity that we will have. That will add to it. So as Jan's saying, Peter, if we're at a bar, I get tested, I come up, it will hit all those bar patrons. We're not reporting what those hits come right now, but we do have data to show where it's coming from. But I wanna just be very clear. We are not demonizing, nor should anyone, this environment. It's just a riskier environment. But in all fairness, you gathering with three or four families in your backyard or worse yet, in your garage for a celebration, 
would have an equally detrimental effect. And, and we'll have to target those too. So I think when you see tomorrow, we're going to try and be much more surgical about this. We're gonna be able to provide some of that data on how we think it slows it down. We also know, just to let you know, that we do believe, Jan, and I don't know how, how the data looks on this, that the infection rates increase after a set time in the evening. That before 10 o'clock, we seem to see, that's, that's at least what we're extrapolating from some of the data. So we're trying to be more surgical We'll try and provide that data, but it's a very fair question. As far as, I'll go back to this one, as far as the Pfizer announcement, um, I, I think it's okay to get a little excited once in a while during COVID. I've been saying that. I have not put out anything that is not data-driven, but I think some of you have heard me say this. The current federal government's response, especially around vaccine distribution, I think has been fantastic, and I've said that. I've said that from the beginning, Jan, would I think you would agree, working with Minnesota and talking about how we would get this. I trust the FDA and the protocols in place that when a vaccine comes, now obviously Pfizer saying so, I, I'm not guessing, but I saw the stock market was up 2,000 points. I guess it's not totally on Pfizer's announcement, but I bet Pfizer's stock went up. We, as a government and as public health officials, cannot allow that part of it to enter into it. But I do think what I would tell you is, should this work, and as Pfizer's pronouncements will have to be scientifically proven and peer reviewed and all of the safeguards, but if we get a 90% effective rate on that, and Minnesota has done the work necessary as one of the five lead states on distribution, that's a really positive development. And, and I think in the age of COVID, we should stay in the data, stay in the facts, stay in that hopefulness of what we can do, and let's get there. And as we've been saying, that alone won't solve it, but with the protocols we put in place and we get a handle on community spread and we get a vaccine, we get our lives back, we get our economy back. We don't get it back by wishful thinking. We don't get it back by holding large gatherings and pretending like any of this isn't real. We get it back that way. So I personally, and I, I think this is exciting news. I'm hopeful around that. And I think Minnesotans should know that the necessary work, because this is a massive undertaking it's looking like, and I don't know if the Pfizer one is this, there will be several different ones that come out and the protocols administering them will be different. Some will have to be stored at 90 below zero. Some will require two shots in a very narrow window that you have to get them. And the data that we're using with Amazon Web Service and some of that is to capture that shot record so that we're not having somebody come in, gets a vaccine and then forgets and says three weeks later, oh yeah, we're supposed to get that follow up. We can't have mistakes like that. We have to make sure that everything is tight. So. Some states from European countries have done the thing with technology of mobile alerts. You get sick, it alerts the people who have been in your proximity. Are we going down that road now? Um, I think so. And, and I say this, and, and I'll tell you, as a privacy person, I went to the ACLU first of all. I went to all of the people that this opt in. Um, because I think, again, during this whole thing, we can't sacrifice privacies and some of that. I know people have said that there's liberties that gets, yes, this is a fine line. Um, I would argue giving away your personal data without your requirement is a pretty big breach of constitutional protection. Asking you to wear a mask in a public setting probably doesn't go there to that point. But yes, I think we're exploring this because I've seen and we've seen the results of it. It's pretty successful. And again, it's totally anonymous. Um, a lot of privacy groups have signed off uh, folks who don't agree to much of this. But I mean, just think about it here. If one of us in here, we all get tested today. If one of us comes up positive, all of us via our cell phones and proximity will get an anonymous notice. That's something that's not happening right now. That's how this asymptomatic spread is getting away from people. Again, I've said from the beginning of this, if COVID just gave you, pop, you know, red spots, that's all we'd need. If we just had a whole bunch of 18 and 35 year olds that we could see had red spots on them, what you're gonna see is that red spot's gonna be your phone vibrating and say, hey, just so you know, you were within six feet for more than 15 minutes of someone who had COVID. How close are you to that vaccine? Part of the announcement that comes tomorrow? We're actually doing some pilot testing uh, on a voluntary basis of this application. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I don't want to guess at what the date might be that we'll be able to roll it out, but we're active. We're doing more than talking. We're actually testing it. Um, wait, what's the, is it a short term or uh, down the road? No, I think it's, we're talking more weeks. 
Commissioner, can you talk about the effectiveness of saliva testing? Are you really concerned about um, uh, false uh, negatives and things like that with, with saliva testing? Yeah, I think um, it, maybe we'd ask one of our vault partners. This, um, this partic There are lots of different tests, as I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, there's more than one type of saliva test. This one was, I, I believe, the first that got FDA uh, emergency use authorization, and the uh, reliability is very, very high. But I would ask, uh, I would ask our partners at Vault to, to speak to that. Okay, thank you. I, uh, repeat the question for me. Uh, just the effectiveness of, of, um, of saliva testing, if there's concerns about false negatives, is that in the higher with this type of test? Yeah, I know that our, uh, it's a PCR test, our saliva test, around 98% accuracy. As far as any false negatives or any, any more technical questions, I can get you in touch with our clinical, uh, our, our clinical officer. Uh, I'm Sean, S-H-A-W-N, last name is Baxley, B as in boy, A-X-L-E-Y. I'm the Vice President of Field Operations for Vault Health. Yeah, one is we were counting on the federal government at that time. They told us that there was going to be a test for everybody, if you recall. I think it's important for all of you to keep track of what was said and what was promised by everybody involved. They told us that it'd be no problem. There'd be testing for everybody. They never delivered on that. You asked me, if you don't get the 5,000 tests by April, who takes responsibility? And I said, me. Um, now, with that capacity and with what Vault has been able to do, we brought it in home here. Now, I know Dr. Ostrom is still concerned that some of the, the reagents around uh, PCR testing might be there. What we've done is we didn't put all our eggs in one basket. We spread them out amongst the different tests. We brought the laboratory right to here. And Vault's kind of modular approach to this is um, that we can continue to expand. Because I think now where we're testing 50,000, imagine that. I remember the day in April when we got to 5,000 and that was as high as almost anybody in the country per capita wise. That's nothing. We're going to have to probably be up, I think most of you get this, probably 100,000 tests to really get a manage on this. We now in Minnesota have that. I am not as concerned about that, but I, do, I think people need to recognize this. It is a fight every day to get N95 masks. It is a fight every day to get gloves that this nation has not implemented the Defense Production Act in a manner that took that off the table. There has not been a federal help. Remember, it's the state's responsibility. Once they figured out they weren't going to be able to test everybody, because it's hard. It's really hard, and it takes organization. When they said they weren't going to be able to do that, we started picking up that slack. And, and I think I can say, because it's my responsibility to do so, that Minnesota has redundancies and a broad range of testing capabilities that we won't run into that problem. But here's the thing. States that aren't doing this, and now with a new administration who is going to put an emphasis on testing and infection control, there is going to be a massive expansion. So now states that we weren't competing against, we will be again. We just think that the move that we made to bring it in-house, put, put that laboratory right in Minnesota and lock up those resources gives us an incredible advantage to get a handle on this. Okay. Well, we will be back tomorrow. Um, again, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not secretive around what we're trying to do. We're talking to our partners. We're gathering the data that we've had. Candidly, we knew that the week of the election would be very chaotic. It would be very difficult. Um, it's also one that, that I um, anguish over and, and talk to Commissioner Malcolm. Um, every day we wait on things that we believe can mitigate the risk um, is another day that somebody got infected and potentially ends up in the hospital. So I think getting this right getting the sequence of, of testing, of, of hospital capacity, and then some of the mitigation measures. And, and my plea to, to Minnesotans, my plea to elected officials is, this never needed to be a partisan issue. It is not magically going to go away, but we have the technology, the capacity, and the will, as other nations have been able to do, to break the back of this thing, to get back to that point, and get to our lives uh, where we want them to be. So again, I'll close with a final one. We're at the Minneapolis Convention Center starting around noon. All of these great folks working here, thank you for that. I am incredibly grateful. Um, stop down by here. It's again, fast for 30 minutes. Um, you'll come here. It, it's certainly not so glamorous to spit into a tube, um, but I'll tell you what, doing so 
just might make sure that we get a little bit closer to breaking the back of this thing. Doing so might prevent your grandparents from getting this thing over Thanksgiving. Uh, might keep our schools open. Might keep that restaurant that's just hanging on by a thread a little better chance to do it. So uh, get here out at the airport soon, 11 armories, um, and we'll continue to beat this thing. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Can we provide that? Yeah, sure. We'll make sure we'll provide the hard data.